everyone, how are you? I am Demetria Ackerson and I'm the new owner of the Inspire Sustainable Fashion label, Redefine Your Mind. Yes, I am nervous, so if I tongue do anything like that, it's because I'm nervous in front of new people that I don't know. So please come to my table. When you meet me, you'll see that I'm a totally different person. <laughs> Well, anyway, Redefine Your Mind as Athleisure is a platform for vegans who want to show their fashionable activism, but who couldn't say we couldn't be sexy badass? Okay? <laughs> so, let me begin. Can we have all the people to the panel, please? Susie Costin, Brenda Sanders, <laughs> Michael Buttkey, Lindsay Wolf and Sebastian Joy. <laughs> Susie. <laughs> Susie Costin is a national sh shelter director of Farm Sanctuary, where she oversees a team of caregivers who provide individualized care to hundreds of rescue farm animals. She also shares her wealth with knowledge with other advocates, advocates, I'm sorry, advocates, <laughs> sorry, acting as a mentor to many peers who have started their own sanctuaries and leading Farm Sanctuary Annual Farm Annual Care Conference. Susie is committed to increasing awareness of family farm animals, sentience through sharing their st stories at speaking engagements, and through the animal a farm sanctuary project, which she founded in 2016. Can I have Susie at the panel, please? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost my screen, so you're gonna have to wait a second until I put in my password. <laughs> uh, I like to make a really great entrance, that's how I work. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about the role of sanctuaries um, in outreach, and one of the things about sanctuaries, obviously, are these, yeah, there it is. I'll wait till you can see the picture. There. That's a sad picture, but we're starting out with a sad picture that will become a happy picture. Trust me. Work with me on this. This is going to be sad, happy, sad, happy. That's the goal. Okay, so the role of sanctuaries and activism is really, oh, and I, do I have a clicker? There's one here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and it doesn't work. Sorry, I'm really, I've got it. Oh, I'm getting it now. <laughs> what? <laughs> I am the most tech-savvy person you're going to meet today. I'm going to let you know that now. Um, so the, the role of a sanctuary, there's so many roles of the sanctuaries, and one of the biggest roles, obviously, is it's a haven. So you're bringing in victims of an industry or any industry and you're giving them a home. So we obviously, I, I oversee farm sanctuaries, so we obviously get animals from the food industry, but other sanctuaries take in animals from labs, you take in animals from cruelty and neglect cases, from entertainment. Animals are coming into a sanctuary and it's a safe haven. So that's one role of sanctuaries. And what you do once they're in that safe haven is clearly you give them the best life that they can get. They have to have a life that's not only giving them their health back, a lot of the problems that we see with animals when they come in is they are psychologically destroyed. That's one of the biggest parts of what we do is trying to get them back psychologically. I gotta keep doing, I've gotta do a double take here. Um, one of the most popular ways that sanctuaries do outreach though is to tell the story of the actual victim and they are victims. So we're talking about 9.4 billion animals. Clearly sanctuaries cannot just do rescue. You have to tell the story of the victim and you don't see victims, that's the problem. Because again, when you're talking about victims and there's 9.4 billion victims, people don't actually see the individual. So sanctuaries are introducing you to that individual and I can't see what slide I'm on. Sorry, this is, this is confusing to me because I'm not good at it, obviously. Uh, so when you, have, when you have animals like this, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so animals that are in crates and animals that you don't get to see because they're behind closed doors, you don't know how many victims there are and you don't actually meet somebody. So when you're talking about the victims that are created, I'm gonna tell one story 
just so you get that. Um, I actually was in California when the story happened. Um, I got a phone call from a police officer who had just gotten a tape, and they wanted us to listen to the tape. I'm not going to make you listen to the tape, but I did actually write down some of the things that came out of that tape, which I will... It all started with an audio tape. This was an audio tape of what was a whistleblower, but it was really just a disgruntled employee. The person didn't actually care about the animal that was in this tape. The person was actually in this tape himself. And I'm going to start with some of the things that were said on the audio. I, t I bleeped. I'm not going to swear in this whole tape. This was the tape. So it's an audio tape. I'm listening to it for the first time while I'm flying from California to New York. And it is a beating of an animal that lasts for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, and this is not an unusual thing, it's a thing that most people don't record. So you can see what it starts with, they put a, put a cattle prod on the effing pig, five minutes, cattle prod right on her. They held a prod on a pig for five minutes. If you listen to this tape, it, it actually sounds like a rape. It's a violent, horrible act that happened to this one animal. This is your victim. This is what she looked like from the cattle prodding. So if you look, you can see that the prods actually burned into her head, into her scalp, all over her back. So she is the victim of this violent abuse. And the reason that she was the victim of this abuse is because she wouldn't move from the farrowing crate where she was artificially inseminated, I mean, sorry, from the gestation crate with artificial insemination to the farrowing house where she was going to give birth to her third litter that would be taken away from her. She refused to move and that's why they were beating her. This is the next part, portion of the tape because again, it lasted for 20 minutes. The person that was writing this down, we did this for a court case, that's why we have it written down, but there was very loud sounds. She was really, really exhausted, so you could hear her kind of like just losing her mind and pat, like she was open mouth breathing and really, really distressed. They had indistinct discussions, but if you look, it's one of the scariest things because she's screaming and screaming, and they're like, they're so angry at her for not moving that if you read the comments, it's absolutely insane what they say to this poor animal because she's not doing what they want her to do. So. One of the ones, that, the, one of the things that's really, really scary that they're saying is they're like, oh yeah, you better understand, I ain't, I ain't no um, effing asshole. And this is the problem: is this man is getting angrier and angrier because she's not doing what they want her to do. So if you look in this slide, this is, this is Julia when we got her in our trailer. And I want you to look at the damage they've done to her. It is absolutely outrageous. So they had beaten her so badly that she was in a state of shock when we got there. And the only reason we were allowed to take her out was because the police actually let us take her out. You never get, you never get these girls out of gestation facilities. You just don't. So this is the rest of the tape. So you can see that it went on and it shows the minutes that it went on. And in, on the 21st minute, they got her in. And they actually did shove something in her nose and grab her by her ears. We could not understand what they were putting in her nose to make her move. She was absolutely distraught. So when I went to the place, one of the weirdest parts about going in was one of the men that I heard on the tape was actually the man that greeted me at the door and took me around the entire facility to show me how amazing the facility was and how kind they were to their animals. So he and every one of the animals had marks similar to the ones that I saw in Julia. And these are some of the sounds, but that's Julia. So that's the very first time that I ever saw Julia. She was down on her side. She was open mouth breathing. I know there's a lot of people here from the SAVE movement. When you see these animals that are in trucks and they're open mouth breathing, some of them are hot, but that's exactly what they do too when they're under duress. And she was under duress. Um, that is the owner of the farm shoving her into our trailer. Um, we did get him to sign her over to us. So she was getting ready to go home, but this is inside the trailer. This is a pregnant female, and they've beaten her so badly that she has blood coming from her teats. She only could produce milk in half of her teats. It was really, really sad. Uh, but they also bruised her, so you can see some of the bruising from kicking and moving her, and that's Julia. So the face, again, and I want you to look at the eyes and the face. When you see these animals in this kind of a condition, it's not just them. It's animals just going into trucks. It's animals that are in all of these industrial farms have this look in there and so absolutely absolutely sad and that was how Julia was that's her first water from us and so this is the first day that we bring her back to the sanctuary and she's unloading from this trailer and she's really really scared and she doesn't know what's going to happen she's actually just won the lottery and she has no idea so <laughs> we we knew that she was due in a week and so we created this amazing bed for her we're bringing her up a ramp we're going to put her in and we have like this indoor outdoor area because she's never been outside so you also have to remember that when they have these beautiful pigs that are living in these facilities they've never ever been outside so this is her very first time to be outside 
We're all excited. Everybody's ready to go. And within an hour, she had a baby. So this is Bertha. Bertha lives at Woodstock. That's your piglet, baby. No, <laughs> that's your piglet. So when she, Bertha was the first to be born. These pigs are a week, a week early. So we're all panicked. And we spent the next 48 hours making sure that every piglet got enough milk. And I'll show you how long that actually took just by the number of animals. Oh, that, and that's Diane. So Diane is actually ends up being the queen of the entire herd. So that's the queen. That's the birth of a queen, if you've never seen it. Yeah. Yeah, they all have such different personalities. And Diane is like the head honcho and takes no prisoners. Um, her mother's actually docile. So again, when you're telling a story about a victim, Julia was a victim, but Julia now has a life. So it's a life that you can talk about all the time. So she always will have that story. But we need to make a connection to an individual and an individual life. And everyone one of her children now also have that story. So this again is us lining them up. And the whole time that this is happening, we have really cold compresses on her. She's overheated. We were giving her fluids the whole time because she was dehydrated. And she let us help her have these babies, which was amazing. Because this is an animal who does not want to be handled. And she's amazing. But look at the difference in her eyes. This was right after she had her babies. You can see how comfortable she is and how trusting she is and how loving those eyes are. And a lot of, it's, it took one day to get her to go from that fear to that happy because the one thing we did that she never had happen was let her keep her babies. And we helped her nurse those babies. So we kept her with her babies the whole time. Look how many she had. <laughs> okay, so this is the other problem. Um, so we were thinking one or two, or three or four, or five or six. She had 16. Um, why not start your family big? Uh, she's awesome. So she had 16 babies, so labor was long. Um, it actually lasted from two in the afternoon until nine o'clock at night. She had her last baby. Um, and they all made it, every single one. And you know why they made it? Because they weren't in a crate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and that and her story also allows us to like squelch some of the myths because you're told that these pigs have to be raised in gestation facilities and they have to be in farrowing houses because they're going to kill their babies. They don't actually kill their babies. When they have a lot of space, they don't kill their babies. They don't accidentally step on their babies. They don't do any of those things. Not one of those 16 babies who I think I might have stepped on more than she did got hurt. They were always like all under your legs and running around. But she was the very, very best mother. And nobody got hurt. So next slide. Why? There it is. That's just them. No, there, I know. The slides are really cute. Um, <laughs> the babies were cute, and it was probably one of the most outstanding things because we were building a relationship with this amazing mother who was never, ever allowed to be a mother. We take that away from them day in and day out. We don't allow them to do the one thing that they do so well, and that is be a mother. And so this is what baby pigs do to their mom. They come up every day, do a little talking into the mouth. They're always like, ha, ha, in the mouth, and the mom's like, ha, ha. And they talk back. They're, it's awesome. And then, they, and when they do that, the mom's like, "Okay, I'll lay down, and then you can nurse." And then all 16 of them pile on her. Uh, and she actually had mastitis. We still made sure that every one of those pigs got fed every single solitary day. And they're all over the place. There, there. That's one of my favorite pictures because when they would come up and kiss her, if a pig's hungry, they foam at the mouth like that. And when they come up and kiss her, they get this big foam blob on their heads, and which was really awesome. <laughs> they're amazing. And she's a very smart mother because in this picture, it was actually really hot. It was super, super hot that summer, and we could not figure out why she wouldn't go in the mud because it, they do naturally go in the mud even when, when we get them out of these facilities. And she wouldn't do it. And I think it was because the babies were too small. And so once they got big, Bigger, she took them all in. So anywhere that she went, the babies went. So like she had to wait until they wouldn't, I guess so they wouldn't drown. Uh, but she had to wait till they were big enough to be in the mud. So that's Julia and her babies hanging out in the mud. They did it every single solitary day. And again, the one thing I want to point out is look at her face. Look at her eyes. She's constantly smiling. Her life became this beautiful, wonderful life. And the only difference between Julia and every other, every pig that we left in that stupid facility is that somebody turned in a tape. So just, somebody just went in there and turned them in and they actually made, they took action and took her out. Like this is the relationship. This is the relationship still. They never, ever, ever stop loving their babies. They stay with them forever.
forever. A lot of mud pictures. Oh. Happy, happy. Yeah, and this is a, and this is a sow that the, the actual whistleblower came to the farm. That was one of the funnier stories, and wanted to get his picture taken, like a selfie, so he could look like a hero. And she went after him. Yeah, because <laughs> there's a reason. <laughs> And when he was in there, he made the comment, his, his two sons, who were probably about six years old, made the comment of, Daddy, you should have brought your pliers and we could have cut off their tails. So, it was a family affair, the business. But he was trying to explain to me how dangerous she was. And you know why she's dangerous? They took her babies over and over and over again. And you know why she's smiling when she's walking towards the camera? She loves us. She loves all of us. Because we loved her enough to let her stay with her babies. You can see them growing. That's Diane and Linus. The queen is growing up. You know, <laughs> Linus is the little one. You'll see the queen soon enough. And this, the other thing about these beautiful animals that come out of these horrible facilities is it doesn't matter what the weather is, they're going outside. Like, so they also teach their babies to go outside. So we're all like, oh my God, it's so cold. And she's like, hey, I'm just plowing through the snow, having a good day, because she now can go outside. There you go, the queen's growing more. So Diane is um, the one that's on her left, and Linus is on her right. All of her babies weigh about 200 pounds more than she does. She was a very small pig, yeah. Yeah, a lot of love in that family. Look at her. Uh, and, she, and they do. They want to spend all their time outside because we've taken this animal and we made her a victim. And the thing that's different here is most victims, the stories you're hearing are the victims who die. We have victims that we can now tell the story of who they are. Because before our victims, we don't know who they are. You don't know who they were when they were in with the other thousands and thousands of pigs. You have no idea. That's one of her daughters, by the way. Um, this, is, this is snow day this year. That's Liza. That's the queen, Diane. If you ever come to the farm, you'll know she's the queen because she immediately shoves past everybody. So she can give, she likes belly rubs, that's why she's down. Uh, and then that's Julia in the snow. So what we do at sanctuaries and the outreach that we do at sanctuaries is to take these victims out of these horrible, horrible places and let you see who they are as an individual and treat them like an individual. Make them the happiest, healthiest, psychologically and physically animals that we can ever show anyone so people can make a connection. Because when you come to a sanctuary and you touch, you touch a being and you learn who they are or you're online and you're reading who they are and you see those great pictures or you see video of her running with her babies, you make that connection, and that connection allows you then to see that all of them are victims. And this is Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Brenda Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda Sanders is a vegan food justice activist in Baltimore City who co-founded Thrive Baltimore, a community resource center that provides resources to help people start living healthier, more sustainable lives. She's also the founder and executive director of Afro Vegan Society. <laughs> <laughs> a nonprofit organization that supports people in marginalized community and transitioning to vegan lifestyles. Co creator <laughs> of Vegan Soul Fest, an annual festival that celebrates culture and all aspects of vegan living, and co owner of Greener Kitchen, a plant based food company that produces vegan foods that are both affordable and accessible to everyone. Brenda Sanders, please. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you so much for um, having me be a part of this esteemed panel of people. Um, Sounds like I'm doing a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the 18 hour days and the five hours of no sleep can actually attest to that. Doing community based outreach is difficult, exhausting, and often thankless work. 
It's also practically invisible work, especially for the activists of color who are currently on the ground doing this crucial work of animal advocacy in marginalized communities. When I first started doing vegan advocacy in the hood, everybody told me I was gonna fail. They said poor black and brown people would never go vegan, that they didn't care about animals, they didn't care about their health, and they certainly didn't care about the environment. What those people didn't realize was that for some of us, being told that we can't do something is the exact motivation we need to not only do it, but to do it spectacularly. In Baltimore, over the last seven years or so, we've gone from basically no interest whatsoever in what we were doing. I mean, folks literally had never heard the word vegan before. They had no idea what they were, what that was. They were like, but you still eat fish, right? It was, it was that kind of vibe. Um, and we have, through community-based um, activism, culturally appropriate and socially appropriate community-based activism, we have built this huge momentum in Baltimore that has just completely taken off in ways that even I could not have possibly imagined. Um, so pe and people don't really know. People actually, like most of you don't even probably <laughs> know who I am. That's okay. Um, it's all right. Oh. <laughs> And there's a reason for that. A lot of the folks who are doing this uh, community-based on the ground work are just so busy. Like we're in the trenches, we're doing this work and it's hard and we just don't really have the resources or the time or energy to like scream out to the world what it is that we're doing. We don't have the marketing budget to make the like really cool videos that we can <laughs> put out there. Shout out to Mercy for Animals for doing that video about me. That was so dope. And uh, <laughs> I feel like at least, thank you, I feel like at least 20 more people know who I am now and <laughs> about the word. No, they have a huge reach. I'm kidding. <laughs> So if anybody is interested in seeing an example of this exciting trailblazing community-based activism that's currently happening in marginalized communities, um, I would suggest that you take a trip out to the East Coast, come to Baltimore, and like take a look at what we're doing. Don't worry, Baltimore is not what you think. It's nothing like The Wire. Okay, it's a little bit like The Wire, but... <laughs> Be that as it may, there is some really, really exciting work going on there. Um, I'm going to be talking more about that work um, at, a, at 3.15 on a panel with Dr. Milton Mills. Um, and I'll also be talking about um, some of the techniques and stuff that we've used to be able to be so successful at this work. Um, the outreach that's being spearheaded by these activists of color in these communities is literally shifting the culture in these communities towards kinder, healthier, and more sustainable lifestyles on a scale that just hasn't happened before. And that's really exciting. So I want to um, implore people, you know, if you know about the work, um, please just keep putting the word out there about what we're doing. Um, we've gotten a lot of um, people helping us to build that momentum, especially on social media. Um, but if you don't know about this work, because it's not, you know, it's not marketed and promoted and, and people just don't know, um, then, you know, check us out. We have um, a website called Vegans of Baltimore, which basically sort of is a compilation of all the stuff that we've been doing. It's amazing, and people just don't know. Um, for instance, Vegan Soul Fest, which is um, a humble festival that uh, was started by myself and Nigel Wright Brown, um, who is co-owner of the vegan restaurant The Land of Kush in Baltimore. Uh, we just got together one day uh, at the restaurant and we were talking about like, what can we do? What, what can we contribute? We've both been vegan for years. We see the state of our community, especially here in Baltimore, um, with the extreme economic marginalization of folks there. 
what can we do? Uh, we knew it had to be fun because people don't want to do boring stuff. We knew it had to involve food because people love to eat. And not just any food, it had to involve good food. Um, and, and that it had to have an education component. So the first year, which was 2014, we just in four months, because um, that's all the time we had, we put together this festival. We were hoping, you know, three or four hundred people would come out and we could start the ball rolling the first year and twelve hundred people packed, you know, that area and, and it was just like way more than honestly we can handle, but way more than we uh, had ever expected. We got uh, news coverage, they were calling us, you know, the Baltimore's newest vegan food festival and um, it was it was exciting and it was humbling and since then each year we have doubled our number our numbers um, to the point where last year we had 10,000 people come out to vegan soul fest Thank you. and that's in Baltimore that is in the town of the wire that is really impressive <laughs> And so, you know, and we've done lots of other things. And, and like I said, it's all culturally um, appropriate. And that's really important when you're doing community-based organizing is that you do things that people want to engage in and things that people want to be a part of. And so that's what we've been able to do with Vegan Soul Fest, with the World Vegan Mac and Cheese Competition, which brought out thousands of people last year in Baltimore to taste vegan food for the first time. But the reason why they were so excited was was because it was vegan mac and cheese and they honestly could not imagine what that could possibly be. <laughs> so most people were there just to figure out what is this? <laughs> and it was really just a huge success. We packed the ballroom and um, and after this year, we're gonna have to be at a convention center or something like this because it's just been such a huge success. Um, thank you. So yeah, you know, um, when I first set out to um, make the hood vegan, <laughs> it's pretty audacious of me. But um, but I wasn't, I just wasn't sure. I, I did, I mean, okay, so my ego was like, you can't tell me I'm not gonna be successful. But then the part of me was like, oh, maybe I won't. Uh, and so it's just been, such a, a, an exciting and wild ride and so gratifying to know that I, as well as other activists who, um, you know, are activists of color who are on the ground doing this work and getting no recognition whatsoever, we, it, it's really gratifying to know that we are a part of something huge, something important, and something that is literally shifting an entire culture towards something better. And so I would implore folks to please check it out. Um, Share, share, share. Come out and, and hear me talk about those things at the sessions. And, um, and, <laughs> um, okay, I wasn't gonna say this, but <laughs> give credit where credit is due. Because this work is hard. And we are not necessarily going to have the kind of visibility that other organizations are just going to have um, because of reasons, we know the reasons. So, so we're not gonna necessarily get that visibility and, and the credit for the hard work that we're doing. And so it's up to people who recognize what we're doing and who think that it's valuable and important to help us to make that work more visible. So I would just ask that, you know, in whatever way that you can do that, whether you're following us on social media, whether you're sharing our stuff, whether you're coming out, whether you're supporting, that, you know, you do something to help make this thing happen. Because we really are, in a lot of ways, changing the world. And I feel like that is important enough to support and share. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Next, Michael Budkey is the co-founder and executive director of Stop 
animal exploitation now. Same. Am I saying that right? <laughs> which worked exclusively on the animal exper experimentation issues by successfully terminating research projects, forcing the USDA to take legal action against laboratories and coordinating releases of animals into sanctuaries. After witnessing the extracites, sorry, <laughs> extricities of animal experimentation during education, he successfully ended a head injury experiment on cats at University of Cincinnati, which launched his career leading to positions which several national organizations and co find of shame. He has been published and travels a lot, <laughs> Extra <laughs> appearing on TV and radio programs to expose the truth about animal experimentation. Please, Michael Butkey. Good morning. In the 1980s, my life really had no direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. But after a lot of soul searching, I realized that I wanted to help animals somehow. As a result of this decision, I enrolled in a veterinary technician program at the University of Cincinnati. I can tell you right now, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. To this day, decades later, I remember many of the experiences I had there. I remember walking down a hallway and looking into a laboratory room only to see a rat beheaded. I remember going up to an empty dog run that just the day before had contained a dog that had become my friend. I remember touching him, I remember feeding him, and I remember becoming attached to him. I know what happened to that dog. I know what lab he went to. And I knew when I saw that empty dog run that I was never ever going to see that dog again because he was very likely already dead. I can still see his face. Silence, my silence in that instant allowed that dog to die and allowed every other dog that was a part of that project to die. I failed them. I didn't know how to speak up for animals yet. In the 1980s, nobody knew anything about animal research. The silence about animal research was literally deafening. Today, whether we are talking about animals or whether we are talking about our fellow activists, our silence often allows exploitation to happen in the first place and to continue. Just as we must speak up to prevent animal, explo animal exploitation, we must also speak up to prevent the exploitation of our fellow activists. Just as we want animals to be safe from harm, we must make certain that our fellow activists in this movement are safe from harm, that our workplaces and our events are safe places for everyone. After I completed my degree and was registered as an animal health technician, my wife and I became activists with a local animal rights organization. And as they mentioned in my introduction, we did successfully end a research project that killed thousands of cats. But Karen, my wife, and I learned one undeniable truth as a part of that campaign. There is only one effective weapon against animal research or any form of animal exploitation. That weapon 
is truth, facts, data. Animal research is an immense issue. It contains hundreds of millions of lives and hundreds of millions of data points. It's an issue that is so large that the general public, in many instances, literally cannot understand of it simply because of the size. We are talking about hundreds of millions of animals dying every year. We are talking about the waste of billions of dollars in federal tax money. And so if we are to communicate this to the public, we have to break those immense facts, those data points down into manageable pieces. The truth is that in the last year alone, 7,700 animals died in laboratories, not from experiments, but just simply from negligence. These deaths and many injuries occurred before the experiments ever even happened. The fact is that the University of Kansas Medical Center killed dozens of animals through horrific negligence, which included accidentally setting a mouse on fire. The reality is that the Indiana University School of Medicine killed 116 animals through sheer negligence, which included starvation, dehydration, drowning, and suffocation. And those deaths were not part of any experiment. The fact is that the University of Iowa's negligence killed over 244 animals through starvation, hypothermia, and cervical dislocation. That's right, they broke their necks. The reality is that negligence at the University of Massachusetts Medical School killed more than 30 animals through starvation, dehydration, suffocation, and decapitation. In addition to that, they actually found living animals in carcass freezers because the staff at the University of Massachusetts is so inept, they actually can't even kill animals correctly. And if they can't do basic things like this, why should we believe they can do science? These are the facts, the truth, and they are bad enough, obviously. We don't need to lie. We don't need to exaggerate because the truth, the facts, the data that we have are shocking and horrible enough. In the case of animal experimentation, we don't come up with the truth. The laboratories actually say these things about themselves, and our job is simply mining this data. In many instances, the credibility of animal rights activists is nothing to write home about. We are not believed by the general public. And so in this issue, that's really not a problem because we don't come up with this data. The laboratories say it about themselves, and all we have to do is speak the truth back at them. After our expose about the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, the Massachusetts Society for Biomedical Research was contacted to comment on what we had said. And while responding to our expose, they said that saying that our stated intent was to end the use of all animal models in medical research. They actually said, and I quote, they go about doing it by chipping away, little by little, eroding public trust. Finally, someone in the animal abuse and experimentation industry got something right. <laughs> we do use facts. We weaponize information and data, and our goal is quite simply to eliminate and close down all animal labs. <laughs> it
Essentially, what we do is we speak truth to power. We refuse to allow the biomedical industry to peddle their lies without opposition. And we refuse to allow them to hide the reality of animal experimentation from the public who pay their salaries. Speaking truth to power has had amazing consequences for us. It has closed Sincool's animal laboratory permanently, where hundreds of guinea pigs were forced every year to literally swim in toxic chemicals. Speaking truth to power, permanently closed Harvard's Primate Research Center. Cages. Cages that imprisoned thousands of monkeys are forever empty. Mm. Speaking truth to power also closed the Santa Cruz biotech industry biotech companies, laboratories, and forced them to pay a $3.5 million fine to the federal government, the largest fine ever levied against a laboratory. All of this is about facts, about truth, and about speaking that truth to power. Sherry Runner from the Chicago office of the Urban League said it best. Speaking truth to power means believing deeply in what you say and fighting every day to have that heard. It may not be popular. It means taking a risk. It means being willing to stand for something. Standing for something. This isn't only relevant to our fight for animals, this must also govern how we treat each other, how we treat other activists, and how organizations interact with each other in this movement. On the most basic level, we must all learn many simple truths. One of them is that no means no. Mm. This impacts not only our fight to control our own bodies, but also to control the arc of our work for animals. Without some uninvolved organization taking credit for what we've done, simply so they can do fundraising. We must not step on other activists or organizations to move forward, just as we must not hold individuals back due to gender, gender identity, or gender orientation. We must not exploit the work of other organizations simply to make money, because in both cases, we rob the animals of individuals who are working for their freedom. Yeah. Finally, as a movement, we must keep our eyes on the prize. This work, this movement that we are all a part of is about one thing and one thing only empty cages. This is not about notoriety. This is not about our salaries. This is not about the size of organizational budgets. This is about empty cages. And I am going to say it again, in case any of you missed it. This movement is about empty cages. Empty animal labs, shuttered slaughterhouses, and animal-free circuses. The exploitations that we fight are not and can never, ever be humane. There is no such thing as humane animal experimentation. There is no such thing as humane slaughter. There is no such thing as a humane circus. Marcus. And if anyone tells you anything different, they are quite simply lying. Just as we were arriving at this conference, a rather startling article ran in Science Magazine. The title of that article was A Cataclysmic Wake-Up Call. Can more candor, candor, yeah, can more candor win back support for animal research? Oh. 
The biomedical industry is justifiably terrified that public opinion is turning against them. I can answer the question posed in that Science Magazine article. The supposed candor of the biomedical industry has no value because they don't know the meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to warn you that right now we're putting up a photograph which some people might consider disturbing. Jen. That photo is candor. It was taken by the USDA inside a Southern California animal laboratory within just the last two years. Candor like this will not bring back support to animal research. Facts like this photo are going to help us end animal research once and for all. And I have one last thing to say to the biomedical industry. Your cataclysm is coming. In fact, it is sitting right here in this room. You have nothing to look forward to but watching as we close every animal laboratory one by one across this country. We are going to shut them all down and we are going to do it with facts. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Lindsey Wolf is a former undercover investigator who has gone behind the closed doors of factory farms, pet stores, vivisection labs, and other industries to expose animal abuse. She is currently the Vice President of the Investigation for Mercy for Animals. <laughs> an international animal protection organization that's dedicated to preventing cruelty to farm animals and promoting compassionate food choices and policies. Lindsay, please. Hi. Hello. Hi. All right. Let's see if I can work both these things at the same time. Oh, maybe, waiting on slides. <laughs> Let's see, all right, there we go. All right, uh, thank you so much everyone for uh, being here. I'm honored to be here on this panel uh, with all of these amazing individuals. Uh, all right, Wait, down, there we go. All right, how many of you here care about animals? Show of hands. All right, yeah, most of you have your hand raised. It's. Uh, <laughs> might be expected at a national animal rights conference. But uh, no matter the audience, whenever I ask this question, pretty much everyone raises their hands. And that's because empathy and caring for animals is a universal human trait. But don't take my word for it, there have been a number of polls and studies done to show that the vast majority of people care about animal welfare and oppose cruelty to animals. In fact, a recent Gallup poll found that the vast majority of people believe that animals deserve protection from harm. So 97% of animals agree, uh, or 97% of people agree that animals deserve, and I think 100% of animals would agree. 97% um, of people agree that animals deserve protection from abuse. Sort of makes you wonder who that 3% over there are. But practically everyone is against cruelty to animals. But right now, billions of animals are suffering on factory farms all across the world. Normally, we can't hear these animals. We can't hear their cries for help, we can't see them being abused, and we can't see the deplorable conditions in which they are forced to live and die. The meat industry keeps these animals well hidden from public view because they know that the vast majority of people are shocked and appalled when they learn just how horribly the majority of farmed animals are treated. Undercover investigations changes that.
My name is Lindsay Wolf. I'm a former undercover investigator and currently the Vice President of Investigations with Mercy for Animals, an international farmed animal advocacy organization. Undercover investigations are vital to exposing and preventing farmed animal abuse. Nearly every piece of animal-friendly legislation changed in corporate animal welfare policy and the decision by countless to adopt compassionate vegan diets stems from the work of an undercover investigator. People have a right to know how these animals are treated so that they can make informed choices and these animals deserve to have their stories told. So to give you a little bit of information about me, I'm originally from Iowa. I started doing investigations, uh, oh geez, over 20 years ago now. Uh, and I also care about animals, like all of you here in this room. So as a kid, when I found out we were eating animals, I felt sad, confused. Something just felt inherently wrong about this concept. Our family dog, Lexi, here, she meant the world to our family. We would buy her birthday and holiday gifts, and I would pet her wondering why we didn't think twice about killing and eating other types of animals. So I proclaimed to my parents that I was going to be a vegetarian, and right then I stopped eating animals. Growing up in Iowa, I quickly learned that the most welcoming place to be an aspiring vegetarian was not Iowa. <laughs> not. Russell Brand, very shocked, yeah. Not even a little bit. But as challenging as it was to be a young aspiring vegetarian growing up in the pork capital of the world, it really only strengthened my resolve to find out why so many people who care so much about their dogs, cats, and other companion animals seem to give so little consideration to cows, pigs, chickens, and other farmed animals. So I began to educate myself on the systemic cruelties that happen within the animal agriculture industry. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. So throughout high school and college, I started to perform my own mini investigations into pet stores, circuses, and animal agriculture. And it all first started when I was seeing animals who weren't being treated well at local pet stores. And at one particular location, I was routinely seeing animals who were um, kept in overcrowded cages, injured animals, and rough handling. So I informed management, wrote letters to store owners, but I was essentially ignored. So I began to covertly record evidence of what I was seeing. I submitted these findings to local law enforcement who told me that they would look into the issue. I wasn't really sure um, what would happen or even if these issues would be taken seriously, but shortly after the pet store was fined and shut down for two days. Yeah. Thank you. That was, that was very... So I was quite encouraged to see that these issues were taken seriously. But this really made me think, if, um, if these are the, the types of things that I was seeing in public places where people are allowed to come and go freely, what was happening to animals on farms where the public isn't regularly around? So I traveled to local farms in my area and sure enough quickly learned that I was not allowed inside of these facilities. They strongly frowned upon that idea. So I observed what I could from the street and during transport and I observed the same types of evidence I saw at the pet store. Overcrowding, injured animals, and rough handling. So I submitted these findings to law enforcement, but I was quite surprised by the response. Basically, I was told that what I was seeing is considered standard practice and legal within the animal agriculture industry. That blew my mind. I was shocked to learn that abuse inflicted on certain animals could warrant cruelty charges, but when, this, the, but when the, the victims are farmed animals, that same type of cruelty is often perfectly legal. In working extensively with both of these animals, I can tell you that there is no meaningful difference. Sure, a cow curling up in your lap might be a little bit heavier than a cat. They will certainly still try. Has anyone had a giant dog who thinks they're a tiny lap dog? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Cows, same thing, same thing. This photo is not uncommon. Just like dogs and cats, cows, pigs, and chickens form meaningful bonds and friendships with other animals, including humans. Most of us grew up rubbing a dog's belly, scratching a cat's neck, or maybe cuddling with a rabbit. What we're not told is that pigs love having their bellies rubbed. Cows will eagerly lift their head up for a neck scratch. And chickens crave cuddle time. 
Since most of us don't grow up cuddling with cows and chickens like we do with dogs and cats, we don't necessarily think of them in that way. But that doesn't make them different. It just means that you may not have experienced it yet. And when it comes to their ability to feel love, happiness, sadness, and pain, all animals are equal, and no one deserves to be treated in the way that animals are treated on factory farms. Undercover investigations are vital in exposing and preventing this inherent abuse and helping to create change. So what's it like to be under an undercover investigator at an industrialized factory farm? Investigators work inside of these dirty, disgusting, disease-ridden environments, and they covertly record evidence of uh, the atrocities they witness on a day-to-day -day basis. Our investigations consistently expose a barrage of animal cruelty, and animal agriculture has proven themselves to be incapable of self-regulation. They thrive in secrecy and darkness, bolstered by the fact that most consumers have no idea how animals are raised and killed for food. In fact, when most people think of a farm, they picture something like this. Red barn, wide open green pastures, happy animals frolicking around. This photo was actually taken directly off of Tyson's website. <laughs> Tyson is one of the largest meat producers in the world and apparently the closest image they could conjure up of idyllic animals on their farms is a cartoon. Why? It's because happy animals on factory farms do not exist. <laughs> You'll find lots of cartoon images put out by the animal agriculture industry because this is what they want you to believe. The fact is that almost 99% of animals currently being raised for food are raised on what are called factory farms. Looks a little bit different from the red barn cartoon image. Green grass, not for animals these days. They're locked inside of these barns until they're carelessly thrown, often literally, onto transport trucks to be killed. This is the reality. This is what the animal agriculture industry does not want you to know. All of these images are from our investigations. And as a society, we're very disconnected from these industries. But I can tell you firsthand that the fairy tale images the animal agriculture industry likes to portray are polar opposite from what life is really like for these animals. Mercy for Animals works to be a voice for these animals through an integrated approach focused on four core areas. We have investigations, legal advocacy, social impact, and corporate engagement. Each of these areas informs and drives our efforts in other areas, but it all starts with investigations. Once we have the images showing the cruelties farmed animals are routinely forced to endure, we can then begin to educate the public and push for change. So I'd like to talk briefly about a few of our recent investigations. In recent months, we've released groundbreaking investigations into the commercial drift net fishing industry. We've exposed dolphins, sea lions, and seabirds trapped and killed in fishing nets. Workers repeatedly bludgeoning sharks over the head with a baseball bat, and fish slowly suffocating to death in nets or left to die on decks of boats. Drift nets are mile-long walls of netting that float into the ocean 100 feet deep. They are incredibly harmful to sea animals and devastating to ocean environments due to notoriously high levels of bycatch. For every one swordfish caught by the drift net fishing industry, it is estimated that seven other animals are also entangled. From the time they are trapped by cruel fishing nets, ripped from their homes, and cut apart while still alive, fish and other marine animals experience an immense amount of pain and suffering. We've teamed up with uh, marine life organizations, Turtle Island Restoration Network, Sea Legacy, and Shark Water. And following our investigations, two laws have been introduced, a state bill and a federal bill that both aim to phase out the use of harmful large-scale drift nets. To take action and to learn more about these bills uh, and our investigations, please visit bandeathnets.com. We're also expanding globally, and in recent years, we've released our first ever investigations in Mexico and Brazil. These cases have helped legislative advances for animals, develop corporate animal welfare changes, and educate people on the atrocities farmed animals face all across the world. We've also taken to these skies and released several drone investigations that provide a non-graphic, unique perspective into the massive scale of these factory farming industries and help consumers to be more aware of how animals are treated on factory farms. 
These investigations help us reach demographics worldwide. For example, our video titled Drones Expose Milk Industry Secrets has over 16 million views alone on Facebook. As you can see, factory farmers routinely get away with treating billions of cows, pigs, chickens, fish, and other farmed animals in ways that would typically warrant cruelty charges if even one dog or cat were the victim instead. So what can you do? Well, if you haven't already made the transition to a healthy, humane, vegan diet, we've got great tips, meal plans, recipes, and more uh, chooseveg.com. Uh, if you've already made the switch, consider sharing these helpful resources with friends and family who haven't yet started their path toward vegan living. If you're not on Facebook, we're also on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, YouTube, and yes, even Snapchat. You will find us. Also on our website or stop by our booth, you can sign up to become a volunteer. We've got lots of great opportunities um, where you can help to create change. Lastly, you can become an undercover investigator. We're currently seeking individuals who are able to uncover the atrocities that are happening right now to farmed animals all over the world. As you can imagine, being an investigator is not for everyone, but it's a vital and important role that is changing the world for animals. And if I could, I would go back and do it all over again. So if you think you have what it takes, please come uh, talk to me or stop by our booth later today. You can also email hero at mercyforanimals.org. Investigations are not only important for us as a movement, but to the individual animals for whom we give hope. Hope for a day when all animals are treated with the respect and compassion that they so rightly deserve. Thank you all so much for being here, for your compassion, for all that you do for animals. Thank you, Lindsay. Last but not least, Sebastian Joy. Teaches NGO management at the Berlin School in Economics and Law and is founded, founder and director of ProVeg International, a ProVeg food awareness organization which is mission to reduce global animal consumption by 50% by 2040. Sebastian also is Veggie World, the world's largest vegan fair. Veg Med, Europe's largest conference on plant-based nutrition. Vegan catering, training, and startup programs. The EU-wide legal definition of this term is vegetarian and vegan. And he invented the B12 toothpaste. I just found that out myself. <laughs> and Sebastian lives in Berlin with his wife and his favorite animal. What's your animal name? Merle, what is it? Melanie. Uh, Melanie Joy. Please, Sebastian, would you please? <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, let me try getting a bit closer here. Um, no. It's a long flight all the way from Germany, but uh, the audience in the US is always so amazing that I, it's always worth the trip. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Trying to get a bit closer. Thank you. <laughs> who here would like to live in a vegan world? Yes. And who would like to have a vegan world for the animals? Yes. A vegan world is pretty much everything, I mean, that's what what's unites us, it's the vision I think everybody in the room shares. However, as most visions actually have it, they are still quite far away. So the planet that we envision, you know, it takes a while to get there. So we kind of like need a way to get to that vegan world where we want to get. And I'm arguing that, you know, even though it's probably not really easy to create a vegan world, it's not more complicated than rocket science. And we did eventually figure out how to travel to space. So basically what we need is just like a, you know, a space program for how to create a vegan world. Now, to create this space program, the first thing you actually have to have is you have to get a lot of people motivated. And then it obviously depends what, is, what motivates people when it comes to food. 
And there is actually data out there. There is the US food demand survey. And what do you think is the number one thing people say that they care about their food? Like, how do they choose their food? What's the one no, number one criteria? Taste. Exactly. Taste came always, they did the survey several times, always comes out first. And then there are obviously other categories, safety, got to be nutritious, uh, the price is obviously important, how the food looks like, if it's, whether it's natural, animal welfare also plays a role, if it's convenient, how, it, how the environment is treated, where it's coming from, and whether it, you know, it's coming from a fair environment, and whether it's new. So those are all, you know, what, what people measure, what, what people say that they care about food. Um, so you see, animal welfare is actually or animal rights uh, is only one one aspect of that. So we actually grouped, you know, what the people said, and we came up with those five, what we call five pros, five pros or f five good reasons. And those are obviously, you know, taste and pleasure. It's health animal welfare, or animal rights, animals, environment, and justice. And so it probably makes a lot of sense, you know, to include all of those reasons when, when you want to communicate uh, uh, the world that you want to create. Secondly, besides you needing a lot of people, what else do you think you need in a capitalist society? Money, exactly. So, and when it comes to money, obviously, you know, for our space program, we want to, we need a, a huge budget. You know, obviously, it's a, it's a huge endeavor, so we need a big budget. So, it probably makes sense to look well in which existing budgets can we tap into, and how big are these budgets, respectively. And so, for example, there is a budget in our society for animal welfare or for animal charities, and uh, this budget is about this size. The figures are in, in for Germany, but the, it's mainly not about the actual figures, but more about the proportions. Uh, so, to give you the German numbers, about 300 million dollars are donated or spent in any way for animal charities, and that's actually mainly shelters. Uh, but then there's also the budget of world hunger and de developmental aid. So do you think that's bigger or smaller than the budget for? Bigger. bigger, okay. And it's actually about 50 times as big. So this is what the government and charities spend on developmental aid and world hunger. So it's about almost 18 billion dollars. When it comes to climate protection and, or environmental protection, do you think it's bigger than the one on the left? Or? Yes, it's actually about close to 40 billion. So that's like over 100 times bigger than what people spend for animal welfare. So basically for every dollar people donate to animals, you have $130 being spent either by the government or by charities or any other institutions on environmental and climate protection. And last but not least, we have diet-related health issues, and that's even bigger. It's close to $80 billion. So if we want to create a space program, you know, creating that vegan world that we all want, it probably may, and we need a lot of budget, it probably makes sense to frame our endeavor not in a way, okay, this is really good for the animals, because then, you know, the only budget we can tap into are these, uh, are the ones on the left, but actually to say, come on, you know, we, we all want to have a space program that's good for the environment, that's good for health, that's good for world hunger. And that's actually uh, one of the reasons um, this work, yeah. Why we have chosen to position ProVet, the organization that uh, I myself and Dr. Melanie Joy and Tobias Leonard have created, don't position ourselves as an animal charity, but as a general ProVet organization uh, with the five pros, pro-animals, pro-environment, pro-justice, pro-health, and pro-taste to do all of that. And also in terms of our mission, if you want to get ex people excited of our vision of that world, we usually don't say that, you know, we're not that open that we really wish for a vegan world. I mean, yeah, we can be quite open. But generally, we have reframed it in a sense that we are thriving for a world where everyone chooses delicious and healthy food that is good for all humans, animals, and our planet. So in green, you see the five good reasons that we have. Now, obviously, that's still a bit vague, you know, having the, you know, what kind of world is that? We gotta be a bit more specific. And 
this is why we looked at other movements actually and we actually realized that yes one of the big reasons that they have is that they have a more, more spe specific goals you know for example when it came to Obama they wanted to in his 2008 uh, campaign you know they wanted to elect him uh, for president or when it comes to gay gay rights or LGBT rights you know they have gay marriage you know a very specific goal and so we looked in these movements and we actually found one person uh, who spent basically his whole career looking at movements and you know looking what what makes them these movements work and so we said look we want to create this vegan world but we don't really have critical mass yet what do we do so he said okay I can help you I've analyzed a hundred movements I can analyze the vegan movement and we had some workshops uh, with him we also had some you know we had to draw different things we had a uh, different organizations invited animal equality was there beyond condison was there uh, German organizations and then he basically cracked the code by coming up with a formula which he named 50 by 40. Or actually, he named it 40, 50, 40, and then Ari Nestle renamed it to 50 by 40. So we're sticking with that because it's actually more explanatory. And this means uh, that we want to reduce the global consumption of animals by 50% by the year 2040. Thank you. And such a specific goal is actually not uncommon. If you look, for example, in the climate movement, uh, you know, there's this big overarching two degree goal where they say, okay, we got to keep global warming below two degrees. And then a lot of activities, you know, whether it's the Paris Climate Agreement or what NGOs do is derived out of that. And also, looking back at space travel, um, when Kennedy announced, um, you know, that they want to fly to the moon, he was also very specific. You know, he said, we want to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely by the end of the decade. And this is actually uh, fits to what in management is referred to as smart objectives. Who has ever heard of smart objectives, smart goals? Yes. That's basically, you know, if you set a goal, you got to make sure that it's specific, it's achievable, timely, measurable, and realistic. So let's take a look at our 50 by 40 mission. Let's start with specific. Um, when we look at the different types of, or sometimes people ask us, well, how do you find 50%? I mean, do you mean, you know, 50% of the number of animals, or it's 50 in, time, in terms of weight? And we've done a lot of thinking, and we realized, you know, if you look at those six categories um, of, of animal products, beef, pork, chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy, just to, to name the biggest ones, um, that the different cost areas, you know, whether you care about animals or public health, put different priorities on these different animal products. So for example, in the animal cars, you know, there's a lot of arguments that because the numbers of chicken and fish and eggs, uh, of the, the numbers of animals being involved is so high that you know, there should be a focus on, on, on those animal products, on those animals. When you look for, ask somebody in public health, they might even say, yes, we're really in favor of reducing red meat, but actually we would like to eat, you know, to see people eat more fish. If it comes to climate protection, you know, they might say, okay, beef is really bad, dairy is bad, but we really don't care so much about fish. While in the environmental movement, they, say, they might say, well, you know, we also want people to, you know, decrease their fish consumption. While, for example, in world hunger relief, you might have the negative effect. You might have heard that Bill Gates gave out 100,000 chicken uh, in, in, into, in Africa and actually in order to relieve world hunger and to, to help people out of poverty. So sometimes you can have all these uh, negative effects d depending on which, which cause you're looking at. So we decided with 50 by 40 what we want to do is to create you know, a common denominator amongst all these causes by saying, okay, we want to have a 50% reduction across the board. So 50% less beef, 50% less pork, less as chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy. So by this, you know, creating like some unity and a coherent movement where everybody can, can get behind. So we are being very specific in that regard. Achievable, that's the next component, also often meet agreed upon, which means, you know, can you create a consensus in society to create a critical mass? And for this, it's, it's important, like, to again, to look at institution, if you want to do institutional change. Uh, for example, if you look at the environmental movement, you know, whether it's the United Nations Environmental Program or organizations, if you ask them, and I mean, and we've met with, you know, all those groups, and we said, them, you know, 
if you ask them what they think of a, a vegan world, they don't really get excited about that. If you ask them, well, what do you think about a 50% reduction? They usually say yes. And as you probably heard by now, you know, Greenpeace actually endorses a 50% meat reduction at least till the year 2050. So they're still 10 years behind, but they're getting closer. Also similar when you look at World Health, uh, you know, health insurances or the World Health Association or the, that's the German Society uh, for Nutrition. Again, if you t tell them, ask them about the vegan world, they, oh my God, they might get really scared. If you tell them, if you ask a doctor, well, what about 50% reduction? They say, yeah, that's actually, we, we really eat a lot too much meat and eggs and dairy, so this is something we can live with. Similar if you talk with companies, you know, vegan world, that's not something that they get excited about. But when it comes to 50 by 40, they might at least say, okay, well, if we can make a profit and, you know, for our sustainability report, maybe it's not that bad of a thing. And last but not least, you know, talking to government of super governmental uh, institutions, you know, like the Chinese government or the European Union, again, They'll kick you out of the door if you talk about a vegan, vegan world, but 50 by 40 is more realistic. And actually, also when you when you talk about when you talk with individuals, this is a, uh, again German statistics, uh, but I think it's actually not that similar in the U.S. Uh, you have about 40 percent of the population being totally conistic, about 50 percent being you know closely you know being already reducing their meat consumption, four to nine percent being vegetarians and vegans, you know maybe half a percent, one percent. And interestingly, if you ask the people what they can see themselves doing in the future, you see 40 percent on this. this statistics who can see they can see themselves further reducing their consumption of animal products. 20% can see themselves going vegetarian, but only 1% can see themselves going vegan. So if you want to get a critical mass by having a more, more modest messaging, you know, you're getting way more people on board. And you know, if you want to build an amazing uh, you know, a space program, you know, as we have you've heard, a lot of support. Uh, timely, that's actually pretty clear, you know, we've said till two, we want to achieve uh, 50 by 40 by year 2040, so that's clear. <laughs> Measurable, that's actually also quite clear, you know, the consumption of animal products is measured on a global level. This is actually how it's predicted to grow, so it's still, you know, supposed to increase, but obviously, you know, our goal is by 2040 to reduce it by 50%. And this point, 2020, or close to that, this is when you know we are going to reach peak meat, how we call it. So this is you know when global meat consumption and production is going to peak uh, and then go down. And we actually just uh, working with Harvard University on a study showing that climate scientists actually agree on uh, on this uh, on this peak meat concept for 2020. Last but not least, is it realistic? Again, let's take a look at other movements. Uh, this is the statistics how smoking has developed in the US over the last century. Uh, so you can see, you know, actually quite similar with meat consumption, it has increased tremendously. And then, you know, there was lots of studies coming out and the non-smokers rights movement started. And then it only took actually 20, 25 years until cigarette consumption was reduced by 50%. And that was already, you know, 19 1998, so actually in the last 20 years, it increased even, decreased even further. And we're also optimistic that it's realistic because we are working on various levels. So the five reasons that we've mentioned, they work on creating individual motivations for get, to getting to get people moving up uh, towards being more vegan, but it's also really helpful for institutional change. And we have defined nine target groups. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you know, it's other NGOs, it's the food sector, it's uh, the medical community, scientific community. And what we always do is we influence the influencers, which means within such a target group, uh, you know, consisting of various uh, various entities, we always try to target the leader. So, for example, you know, targeting Greenpeace. And once Greenpeace says, "Okay, we are in favor of a 50% meat reduction," probably other NGOs are going to follow. And I'll give a more detailed talk about all the activities that we do uh, around influencing influencers and institutional change tomorrow at 11:30. Um, and all these institutional change basically serves a bit like as a weight to 
you know, make it easier uh, that people don't have to go upstream to go vegan anymore, but actually, you know, uh, and eventually the world is <laughs> supposed to look like this. <laughs> And this is going to make it much easier uh, to go further. So coming back and coming full circle to our space program, um, one way to look at the 50 by 40 program is, in, the, you know, in, in rocket science terms, is that it's acting like as the first stage of our big rocket. So you know, often in space you have two stages. You know, the first one is getting you out of the atmosphere, and this is what 50 by 40 does. With the, and the five reasons are like the five propulsions that you can actually see on the, at the engine. Getting, getting us really out there. And once we are there in the year 2040, we can launch the second stage, set the second stage, which is going to take us all the way towards a vegan world. Thank you. Thank you to you, all of you. Um, now for the announcements, Jen Riley. Okay, anyone that was assigned to have any announcements, um, you can come up. <laughs> well, this includes South. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>